Terry Butler, welcome to the program. Now, there was a, a big swing to the Greens in areas of Brisbane that are covered by your federal seat of Griffith. I mean, how worried are you about that? Well, actually, if you look at the statewide result, the Greens vote actually went backwards, and I think that's part of the story of this election, the collapse of the minor party vote. But it went up in your, in, your, in your part, part of Brisbane, of, is the point I'm making. In my part of the world, in, in inner city Brisbane, we, we have seen, I think, a real outlier here, which is South Brisbane. And South Brisbane is the result of the LNP's attempt to get Jackie, frankly. I mean, what we're seeing right now is the fruits of a decision by the LNP to do everything that they could to get Jackie Trad out of the parliament. And now they've delivered a Greens party parliamentarian to the Queensland parliament. I mean, the LNP, by deciding to preference the Greens in this way, has effectively endorsed the Bob, Roy the Bob Brown convoy into central Queensland. They've worked hard to get more Greens into parliament. It looks like they've only got one more Green into parliament, but I think that they will be reflecting very carefully on whether that was the right decision in coming months. And right, okay, we had federal LNP, uh, front, former front bencher Matthew Canavan saying as much last night. But on your own seat, I mean, we saw at last year's election a swing to the Greens and last night, obviously, in the state seats, a, a big swing in those areas to the Greens. Just to be clear here, you think this is all about the LNP preferencing them? You don't think Labor needs to worry about that drift to the Greens? Oh, David, absolutely. The Greens improved their primary vote in South Brisbane last night compared to 2017. But what locals know is that that's on the back of a, just a, frankly, uh, disgraceful smear campaign against Jackie Trad. The Greens were running billboards saying end corruption, vote Green, uh, against Jackie Trad in her own seat, effectively leveraging a conservative smear that was found to be completely untrue against Jackie Trad to try to get her out of the parliament. It seems that's worked. Their allies in Extinction Rebellion were stealing. They stole Jackie's banner uh, from the Council of Unions building, dumped it outside the parliament with a huge pile of manure on it, defaced it. Uh, Jackie's had the word slut written across her signs. She's had signs being uh, thieved. One of the Greens activists decided to bizarrely follow her around for some reason. I mean, this has been a concentrated, targeted, disgraceful campaign against Jackie Trad by a number of people, clearly, uh, over a very long period of time. And that has borne fruit. I think it's, it's, it's a real shame for the Queensland Parliament to lose Jackie. She's a friend of mine. I think she's made an excellent contribution both in the government but also as a local member, and you can see that in the area. Having said that, of course, uh, I congratulate the Greens for their win in South Brisbane uh, last night, and I look forward to, the, to them now delivering on their many promises, uh, many, many promises that they've made to the locals there. Well, let me, uh, let me ask they, you... I suppose, uh, sorry. to do through uh, uh, both abolishing mining and taxing it more. Well, uh, let me ask you more broadly about the Queensland result, uh, because we've seen Labor at the state level uh, last night, yes, lose a bit of ground to the Greens on the left, but you know, expand its hold in the centre. And it's won now three elections in Queensland. Labor federally hasn't been able to reproduce those results uh, at the federal level. Why do you think that is and how do you think it can uh, translate these state results to federal results? Well, I think that uh, federally we are going to take a lot of heart from last night's result. Incredible result from Anastasia Palaszczuk, who's been a strong leader, who has kept people safe through her resilience, through resisting the bullying, the interference from the federal LNP and others uh, in relation to borders. You know, she has come under pressure from everyone, from the Prime Minister to Peter, to Peter Dutton down, uh, to, to renege on her position on borders. Deb Frecklington called for the borders to be reopened 64 times. This is a Premier who has stood up against that bullying, who has insisted on listening to the health, health advice and as a consequence has kept people safe. So full credit to Anastasia. But also I think uh, I was listening to your panel before and Nikki was right. I mean the Prime Minister came to Queensland, spent a week here effectively telling Queenslanders how to suck eggs and they didn't like it. We don't like it when Southerners come up here and tell us how to live our lives. So I think that uh, there was a lot of uh, well, as you rightly said, there was a lot of concern about seats like in Cairns and Townsville. But once the PM got involved, we really strengthened our vote there because I think people didn't like what they saw from the Prime Minister and did like what they saw from Labor. So the lesson, I think, for federal Labor is that if you get the policies right, if you get the health response right, then people will like what we're going to say. Let me move beyond uh, the Queensland result. The Royal Commission into last summer's bushfires was released on Friday and it says in part one recommendation, new powers to allow the federal government to declare a state of national emergency and deploy troops even if a state hasn't actually made a request. Do you think that's a good idea? 
Well, it was a very important Royal Commission report. We're still reviewing it, of course, but I think it's important before getting to the individual recommendations to remember that 33 people died, 3,000 homes lost, and of course, 3 billion animals either killed or displaced in the fires. So we have to, as a nation, take this report from this Royal Commission, which has been very detailed, which has been very clear and has a lot of merit, and look at every single one of those recommendations. So not in a position to, to take a position on any specific recommendation at this stage, okay. but it is important that we do look at it very closely and we also need to think about what the report had to say about climate change. Well, it says about climate change, quote, extreme weather has already become more frequent and intense because of climate change. Further global warming over the next 20 or 30 years is inevitable. And it says catastrophic fire conditions may render traditional bushfire prediction models and firefighting techniques less effective. Can I ask you, does Australia need to lift its short term climate ambition? Well, the bushfire report talked about the impact of climate change. The government received the drought coordinators report last year, which also talked about the impact of climate change on uh, more severe and longer droughts. The government has been getting clear warning signs from many, many experts for a long time about climate change, and yet they have been absolutely woeful when it comes to taking action on climate so change. So what should it do so in the short term? Needs to tell, well, this government needs to tell Australians what they intend to do to reduce emissions. The fact is that when Labor was in government, over a six year period, emissions reduced by 15%. When the coalition's been in government, over a six year period, emissions have reduced by 1%. Their track record is terrible. They, as the government, need to tell Australians what they intend to do to make sure that we play our part in reducing emissions. But should, frankly, should, should Australia be doing climate more? climate change is a problem that needs to be seriously addressed. Should Australia be doing more than a 28% emissions reduction by 2030? Well, the government needs to ex explain to Australians what they intend to do in order to meet our international obligations and also to meet the obligations that Australians think that we have. That, I'm just, I'm just asking if you that think that's, that's ambitious enough. Well, it's up to the government to explain what they think we should be doing in relation to emissions reduction, David. I mean, they are in the government. They're on the Treasury benches. They're in their eighth year of government. Uh, it's, not a, it's not good enough for them to be pointing at us and saying, what would Labor do in a hypothetical situation? Sure, but you could have a position. You could put government. pressure on them. And you the could suggest what they should do. You're the, the opposition. The election isn't until 2022. Okay, but you, you are the opposition. Sorry, I missed you, that, David. You are the opposition. You could suggest a position. You could take a position. You could put pressure on them. Well, we've called for net zero by 2050, and we've rightfully done so. We've done it. The, Bris the Business Council of Australia has done it. Uh, the NFF supports that. The largest bank supports that. Uh, we've got people across this country lining up to support net zero by 2050. But, but nothing and this by 2030. Won't even come at 2035. That. They're really an outlier. They're out on their own on that. Uh, I think I'm losing you. Hang on a second, David. <laughs> Sorry. They're out on their own on that issue. If they won't even come to terms with the fact that what they need to commit to that. Uh, then of course they're not going to get into a situation where they're taking no. strong action on climate change. And frankly, we've got a minister who doesn't really believe in renewables, which is part of the problem. Can I ask you about environmental laws? The government did rush through changes to the uh, environment protection laws through the lower house, at least in August. Uh, it it uh, hasn't actually brought it on for debate in the Senate though uh, yet. This is about creating a one-stop shop for approvals. Uh, the government has been waiting to receive uh, a review from Graham Samuel by the end of October into um, uh, national environmental standards. So presumably it's got that now. It was due to receive it by the end of October. If those standards are adequate, would Labor actually support having a more streamlined approvals process? So what we've said about this really important statutory review is that it needs to be respected. Graham Samuel is the leader of the review. He released an interim report to the government back in uh, mid-year and it was then a few weeks later released to the public. That report set out a comprehensive set of ideas for immediate reform uh, and then said that there would be further suggestions to come with the final report. The government then took that set of ideas for immediate reform, put them on the shelf, instead went up to a 2014 piece of legislation, dusted it off and put it in the parliament, rammed it through uh, and then it sort of disappeared. It didn't get put before the Senate. So what we want to see is a proper consideration of the serious recommendations from the reviewer, who is a very well-respected businessman and regulator, but who has also been engaging with the National Farmers Federation, with the BCA, with the MCA, with the Conservation Foundation, with the Wilderness Society, with WWF, with HSI, with a range of traditional owners, scientists, regulators, environmentalists. Uh, there are so many people putting input 
into the ideas of getting national environmental standards, a strong compliance so if they're, body if they're adequate to make standards, sure the right thing is being done. Sorry, just to come back to the well, question, if, saying, if those standards are adequate, would you support a one-stop shop approach for environmental approvals? We have said we'll consider anything that the government wants to seriously put forward that is consistent with what's being recommended. But it's not just about, uh, you know, who gets to make the decision and what the standards, whether there are standards. It's also about what's in the standards. Do they have broad support? What compliance arrangements are in place and what resourcing arrangements are in place? And don't forget, David, this is the government that managed to have a 510% increase in the delay for major project approvals that managed to get to a situation where 79% of environmental decision making was being affected by error or non-compliant. In a single year, they made 95% of key decisions late. Now, where those decisions are because of funding cuts, you know, the department was gutted, or mismanagement, well, that means unnecessary delays to jobs and to investment. The fact is, you gut the environment department, there's going to be consequences mm. for decision making. So there's a whole range of issues that they have as a government. And as I said, we've got an open mind. We've maintained that open mind. But okay. what we want to see is not ignoring Graham Samuel's report, but putting forward something that is consistent with all of it, not cherry picking from it. A final question on gas. Uh, the shadow uh, cabinet has agreed on something of a peace deal, apparently, in relation to, in principle, support for gas. Can you just clear up for me your view on this? Would you like to see more gas used in Australia or less? Well, for, for a start, I'd like to see Australia have an energy policy. The coalition has had 22 different energy policies over their time and still can't seem to land one because they're so okay. riven. With just asking about division. your position, just, just briefly if we can. Position, more gas or less? Look, the fact is, we believe that Australia can become a renewable energy superpower and we also believe that gas will be a part of an important part of the transition to getting there. And that's the difference between us and the coalition. We want to be a renewable energy superpower. They've got an energy minister who doesn't even support renewables. OK, but just to answer the question for viewers, would you like to see more gas or less? Well, we'd like to see gas form an important part of the transition to Australia becoming a renewable energy superpower. Uh, that's what's important here, is getting to a position where we make sure that we are standing up for jobs, standing up for renewables, and mm. making sure that we put downward pressure on power prices for consumers and business. The government has done the opposite, and that is a significant problem. Okay, I'll, I'll just try one more time though. Does that mean more reliance on gas or less? Well, David, it means that gas is an important part of the energy mix while we transition to becoming a renewable energy superpower. Okay. I think that's what people want. They want us to actually stand up for renewables and they also want us to be realistic when it comes to transition fuels like gas. You've got a situation in this country where you've got the Liberals and Nationals attacking renewables, not supporting them. You've got the Greens trying to demonise gas. Labor, is the people, Labor are the people in the middle with the sensible approach. We are the people who are actually saying, not only do we want to become a renewable energy superpower, we want to be realistic about what it's going to take to get right. there. And that's why, when, I, when I'm answering your question, I know it's not the answer that you necessarily want, but I'm saying to you, we absolutely have to be focused on how do we get there? How do we build those jobs? How do we make sure that industry is supported, that input costs are reduced by making sure that energy costs are... Uh, okay. There's downward pressure on, en on energy costs. And how do we then become a renewable energy superpower? power and that's the ambition that we have for this country. All right, Shadow Environment Minister Terry Butler, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks David.